Science Gallery Bengaluru is a place, and, I, and, and I, I, I imagine a public space for science, any kind of public space for science has the responsibility to, to create a cultural conversation that allows for the public to know enough about science. They don't need to understand quantum mechanics. Not everybody needs to become a physicist. Not everybody needs to become a mathematician, but they need to and deserve to know and participate in debates that determine the course of their lives. Welcome to the third episode of the Anahita Speaker Series, a Carnegie India initiative that celebrates stirring stories of women who lead and inspire. I'm Mahima Gubarthan, Editorial and Communications Coordinator at Carnegie India. On today's episode, I will be speaking to Dr. Janvi Falke. Janvi is a filmmaker and a historian of science and technology. She's the founding director of the Science Gallery Bengaluru, and is the Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee Visiting Professor at the National Institute of Advanced Studies. Janvi is the author of The Atomic State, Big Science in 20th Century India, and has recently co-edited Science of Giants, China and India in the 20th Century. She's also the director producer of the documentary Cyclotron. Thank you for inviting me to Anahita. It is a pleasure to be here with you, uh, Mahima, and to be able to say a few words about why I do what I do. So let me start by saying a few words about Science Gallery Bengaluru. Uh, the project is an international network. So we are eight galleries across uh, the world, and we are all university linked in some way or the other. So seven of these eight galleries are university owned, they're on university campuses. Bangalore is an outlier. And so when I was asked to take on the responsibility of delivering the same mandate, which was of creating opportunities for public engagement across science and art to begin with, um, and interpret that model for Bengaluru. I was excited by the challenge. I also felt it was a necessary and important project to be done. And so I sort of took on the opportunity and came, came to India and here I am. So to say a little bit about how I began to interpret the model for India, the first thing to notice about higher education in India or the university world in India is that we function very strongly in silos, right? So if you look at, you know, engineering education, it's Indian Institutes of Science, Indian Institute of Technology, Indian Institute of Management, School of Planning and Architecture, National Institute of Design, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, I could go on. There are very few, if at all, university campuses where you can study everything from cinematography to law to medicine to history to physics. And so what this means is that you can go through your entire education, be it undergraduate or postgraduate, without meeting anyone from another discipline, get a sense of how they work, get a sense for you know what, what they burn for, get a sense of what their work even involves. And therefore, when we confront someone from a discipline different from ours, it's often hard to imagine why they do what they do and how they do it at all, or sometimes we trivialize it or sometimes we make it opaque, right? And there is a hierarchy to it. So what we trivialize very often are the humanities and social sciences and art, and what we make opaque are careers in, in science and engineering, to some extent medicine and law, right? And so we function with this hierarchy, we function with this opacity, we function in silos, and it is while these silos are actually there elsewhere too. So it's not that, say, in universities in Europe and America, where for the largest part, the silo problem is less stark than in India. It is still found there, right? So where the, the bridging though is much less of a challenge than it is here because we are just so separated, right? And so the first task I had at hand was how are we going to create an institution that offers public engagement across disciplines to in a setting where this conversation or avenues for that conversation are simply not there. 
And so very early on, one decision that I took was that this place was not going to in many ways do exactly the same work that our other sibling galleries do, which is that of showcasing collaboration across disciplines, especially natural sciences and art, but also become a place that encourages that collaboration and conversation by bringing into a mix the humanities and the social sciences. So in the, in, so as I, as I like to put it, in the science bucket, like in Europe, but less so in the Anglo-Saxon world, in the bucket of science come in the human, the social and the natural sciences. And then in the bucket of culture, you know, I decided to put in not only art, which was a part of our mandate, but also to include all other forms of creative expression. And so, so expanding, you know, science in the European sense, expanding uh, uh, art to sort of become more inclusive of other cultural forms of expression. And then let us make an experiment and let this project be an experiment and let it operate through experiment. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that the project now is a place not only to showcase collaboration across disciplines, but also a place where this collaboration itself can happen, right? And it happens through experiment, not only because the institution is an experiment, but because we have a public laboratory complex where such coming together in experiment will be encouraged, will be, you know, um, uh, and, uh, sort of nudged and nurtured to flourish in order for it to become the kind of place that can create the following. It can enable, in a very small way to begin with, a cultural conversation around science. So this is what I often like to say, which is that we have a very strong professional conversation around science in India. So, you know, what, what is a professional conversation? It's about grades. It's about, you know, rankings of institutions. It's about prestige. It's about upward social mobility. So what is the profession? Right? We don't necessarily have a cultural conversation around science, which would involve, for example, talking about, okay, so vaccines, you know, which something the pandemic has brought to the fore, um, but also other things, you know, what does research that is carried out in laboratories and in the field have to do with my life, right? That kind of a conversation around a dinner table where you, you know, either watch a documentary and, you know, or you watch a sort of a, you know, or you read um, an interesting article, you know, in a, in a magazine, I mean, we have so little of science writing in India, right? Like most of what we have, the little that we have is science communication. We don't have a vibrant discussion on what it means to our lives, why we should even care about it, why, you know, so to give you, an, to give you another example, and, I, you know, this is again an example that I, that I quite like because my, my education started out in civics and politics, right? So I have undergraduate and postgraduate degrees in civics and politics before I turned to history of science, is that today, how can a professional, you know, say in who does civics and politics, right? Like the, who's either teaching or doing research in civics and politics, how can you enter a classroom and talk about democracy without understanding algorithms and Facebook and Cambridge Analytica and what that has done to electoral behavior, right? So things around us are changing. And that's what I mean by everyday life and research, everyday life and science, everyday life and technology, everyday life and engineering, right? So these things impact the manner in which we arrange our lives, the manner in which we take decisions. For example, on CRISPR and the, and the impact is it has on thinking of, you know, future sort of, you know, um, medical technologies or genetics and future medical technologies or even enhancing technologies which are, which are perpetrated. Surveillance. All of these matters that are hugely sort of, you know, at the basis of, of, of fundamental research that, are carried, that is carried out in science and engineering uh, laboratories have an import to our daily lives. Space travel becoming possible might look like a remote dream now, you know, and this is something uh, Sushmita spoke about uh, in the series, but it is on its way, just like at some other point, some other technology was new. So what do you, how do we think about emerging technologies? And if we don't think about it, together with those who make it and those who regulate it, then effectively we are dealt with a deal or, you know, where we are dealing with the consequences, sometimes unintended, sometimes intended. We are essentially reacting to what is thrown out in our lives rather than knowing and participating or understanding or trying to, you know, have a say in what kind of new technologies are developed and what they might have to do with our lives. So that's what I mean by a cultural conversation. So. 
Science Gallery Bengaluru is a place, and I, and and I, I I imagine a public space for science. Any kind of public space for science has the responsibility to to create a cultural conversation that allows for the public to know enough about science. They don't need to understand quantum mechanics. Not everybody needs to become a physicist. Not everybody needs to become a mathematician, but. they need to and deserve to know and participate in debates that determine the course of their lives right and that is where the mission statement so to speak for science gallery bengaluru comes in which is to bring science back into culture right because it always belongs there science is a social and cultural enterprise it is not outside of society and so any talk about science and society in many ways is setting up a false binary because this is a social enterprise this is a cultural enterprise and so that's that's the that's the task that's the you know um mandate for us and that and and that i take that mandate that responsibility i take quite seriously and that and that's the work i've set out for myself and I've, i'm in many ways sort of interpreting the model that we have in the network to suit two things one is to suit the indian circumstance where silos you know and and the lack of conversation needs to be addressed but also future facing in that it becomes a place not only to make that comment about the missing conversation the missing cultural conversation but a place that actually enables that cultural conversation so that in you know many ways is is the work that i do at science gallery and that's the that's the path on which we've set out to yeah to do things. i think that <laughs> i think that's very intriguing because even i grew up with those uh, science and arts often pit uh, pitted against one another uh, and even galleries i think were just these places you'd go to you'd have this relationship with whatever you're viewing but that yeah. it was limited to viewing and now this takes it a step further um but uh, so coming back to uh, around how you went up went out setting um setting up the science gallery uh, i wanted to know a little bit more about uh, how you went um, about creating the space and what are some of the challenges and even opportunities or support systems that you encountered um, along the way yeah so as i mentioned you know we are a network and so there was something to start with right like there was a model that started out in dublin that that was there to and that was that was there for us to for all of us for all of us you know the the seven galleries that joined into the network for all of us to expand to create and interpret it in location in locations that they are and what that might mean right so that that in that was the starting point and that was the strength and the and the twist so to speak like you very rightly pointed out not which is which is to create a place that is not only for viewing but actually for participating but not participating on the terms of the institutions but rather actually having the opportunity to set the terms of that participation right so so that's that's the you know so that's the that's the arena that that we are shaping at science gallery bengaluru through also our exhibitions um and we are trying to give it a little bit of a twist to say you know there are living museums there are living archives can we create living exhibitions and you know in a sentence a living exhibition is a is a is a you know in an exhibit an exhibition of course but it's a place which has um, sort of multiple opportunities that give back to the viewer the ability to interpret what is being shared with them so most exhibitions will have a narrative and an interpretation that the makers of the exhibition often the curators and the institutions behind them and then then that that message plays out in the narrative right and so in many ways we 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 sort of deny the narrative in, and so the, or rather deny priority to the narrative and what we say we will do is give the viewer the opportunity to crack open the creative processes behind the exhibits they see and also use that as a as a starting point for asking new questions to see whether you know this is not a place merely for consumption of knowledge but actually one of you know one from which you can take back questions towards the creation of new knowledge so that's the that's the idea we are sort of developing and you know um we are getting some traction on it and i'm quite you know quite delighted the uh, our latest exhibition got reviewed in the lancet which was a very proud moment for the team and for myself of course uh, we also got a little prize for it so so you know so it's it's it seems like it's it we are able to expand and we are able to create new ideas both for the model of the institution but also our activities as we as we move along 
biggest challenge if you ask me that i have confronted is finding people finding a team that can understand the project work with me um to realize this project so the people i found are incredible i you know I, i'm i'm grateful that i that i have such a fabulous team to work with and i'll tell you why it's a challenge because of the silos that i spoke about right at the start right like to find people who are able to believe that something good is possible beyond disciplines but you actually do respect the disciplines also that becomes a problem right because those who come from the sciences think this is or many who come from the sciences think this is about science communication this is about taking research to the public and then you know i have to sit down and explain no that's not what we do that job is for science communicators and they you know they are required but this is not that and then many from the arts and humanities and social sciences have this sort of dread of science right like the minute they see the word science they think they actually don't belong in the mix at all and so you know we often don't get people we we you know who who have an easy buy in into the model itself and so finding people who are you know able to challenge and yet respect disciplines has been you know been the biggest 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 challenge and so what are, what we what we have is a very young team who are not set in their ways and have now come and we work together i've been able to mentor them uh, they've been able to learn from me and from others and it's now in the collective sort of growing together that you know the team grows so i think you know it's 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 uh, but obviously as as our, our work grows we need more people and you know again the same challenge is so it's a, it's a journey that kind of so i think that in many ways is um, is is a is is the biggest challenge that i have now of course there were other challenges when i started out right like um so i've been an academic i mean you know i started out i always you know always and always but in my growing years i i sort of um was convinced fairly early on that you know i want to be a, be an academic i wanted to be a professor and so you know i i until i took on this job 4 years ago i was in full time academia i was teaching i was doing research i was supervising students and so when i walked into this role um it demanded of me the steepest learning curve i've ever had uh, you know and i thought i had sort of you know done research and everything um i had to learn company law i had to learn things about audits and building tenders and architectural drawings and um you know yeah things that i did not know anything about and i think that you know uh that was a challenge uh that does sort of you know uh, shape my life now i think i'm i'm far more comfortable than i was uh when i started out but it was it was you know the first year especially um was challenging because you know uh, after spending nearly you know 15 to 17 years walking into a classroom you know knowing what you are knowing what you're going to say and being respected for what you know no matter how good or bad um you know your your knowledge of the of the we are you assume to know right like when you walk into a classroom or when you supervise students or when you attend a conference the assumption is you know what you're talking about and of course you have the opportunity to prove yourself to be an idiot but you know in most cases many of us don't take that opportunity and we prepare ourselves and we we know but to be in a situation of responsibility where your starting point is i don't know was um was tough because it you know to to say i don't know and have the room to grow is different from i don't know but i'm responsible for this was kind of you know the the balance that i had to find in the first year um yeah happy to say i have sailed through it and i have no idea if i'll ever need these skills in my life but you know uh, they're useful now yeah no that's uh, that's i mean fascinating um i just wanted to uh, know a little bit more about um, you know these you mentioned a few things where you said that uh, you were an academia before and those were things that you knew you were comfortable uh, but then there was a change where you shifted to uh, being now the founding director of the science gallery so um, tell me a bit more about your own journey how did you come here and what what interested you in this um, and what were the several changes from knowns to i don't knows and take me through that you know fairly uh, so at at 15 as you know many students in india i decided to study um, history politics and economics that's what i started out with uh, and ended up with civics and politics uh, for the for the for my uh, postgraduate studies and that was the, that was the first time in in 
in my life that I confronted, um, you know, uh, the argument or the position of many people around me. My, my parents were fine with it, but, you know, people in the extended family were like, well, her marks are good. Why is she going to study arts? And, uh, you know, I wanted to, so I did. And, you know, it's so, but, but it was, it was sort of the first time experiencing what the hierarchy that I now speak about or that I now realize analytically, you know, uh, the consequences of the way our education is organized or, or uh, you know, the way we uh, in many ways place premium on certain kinds of knowledge uh, in society, etc. But that was the first time I experienced it, although I don't know that I had the analytical tools at that point of time. Uh, but I knew that I wanted to do this and I, I, I was not going to be, you know, forced into uh, doing something else. And I think so. So then on, I mean, you know, so I, I did go abroad for my for my postgraduate degree uh, to the School of Oriental and African Studies. Um, came back, started on a PhD um, at uh, IIT Bombay, and very soon I I realized that I was actually quite unhappy, quite unhappy with what I was expected to do. And, you know, and, and this is not only about institutions. This is also about the questions that my discipline was asking then, um, what, how I was expected to answer them, what counted as sources, what didn't count as sources. And I just felt in many ways stifled and I needed a break. And it is at that point of time that I decided to, you know, find a new path for myself. And so like many, many students, then I wrote lots of applications, uh, some of them to sort of fairly random places where, again, sort of, you know, like you, like you said, tell, tell me about the don't knows. Um, and so when, uh, when time came to choose where I was going to actually go, um, I had the choice between going to three places where I could have continued more or less what I was doing, but possibly, you know, with a, with a, with a slightly more expanded horizon. And then I also had the choice to go to Georgia Tech, which is where I ended up going, um, to study in a school for history, technology, and society, about which I knew very little. Uh, actually, I knew nothing. And I went there and I, well, I told myself, I will give it two months. And if it doesn't work out in two months, then I had the option to take one of the other three choices that I had and that you know, I, would, I would go and um, you know, continue my studies that way. And I fell in love with what my coursework, you know, just, just within the first month, I knew that I was going to do this. I was going to study history of science and technology, even though it meant now starting from scratch, right? And this is another thing that often we get told when, you know, especially in India, but also elsewhere, that you're going to lose some years. And, you know, I was going to lose the years of my postgraduate degree and my years in my PhD program because I was going to start a completely new program. And I, yeah, I mean, you know, at that moment, it felt like the right thing to do, and I did it. And here I am, 21 years later, um, still extremely, extremely happy with the decision uh, of having moved fields. Um, and then, you know, the journey continued. I got into academia, and, you know, I was doing it until four years, and that was the second uh, major. I don't know moment uh, when I, you know, I got a call and, you know, would you like to do something like this? And I was like, okay, so I am in a tenured academic position. I can keep this with a few assumptions until I retire. I will have my pension. And here's a project that I'm supposed to go and establish from scratch about which, you know, like we spoke about, I didn't know company law, I didn't know anything. Not that I didn't even know I needed to know all of those things when I said yes. I mean, I, I had a faint idea, but not really an in-depth idea of wanting to do this work. But at that moment, I think that the, the, the thought that in many ways that sort of carried me over uh, any doubt was that this was an opportunity to establish something new, an institution that was much needed, and an opportunity to shape something meaningful, which is very difficult to do from within the university when you know your primary responsibility, and it's fair, is to train young students, to teach, to supervise, to do your own research and keep yourself updated all the time about new knowledge in your field, etc. 
So the opportunity to reimagine, you know, what informal learning might even look like and to set up sort of the structures for it and the programs for it, so the hardware and the software for it, sounded like a good enough challenge to take on. Of course, I, I still have moments where I feel like, oh my God, I wish I'd just not, you know, uh, done that. But uh, here, here I am. And, um, you know, again, um, I am extremely happy with uh, where we've come, you know, like with, with what I've been able to do so far. And this is based on responses I've had from people, including my own team and, you know, others who I work with, that this is worthwhile. This is something that has meaning. And so I, I, I feel quite, I feel quite content. I mean, there are there are days on which I'm demoralized. There are days on which I'm very happy. You know, all of, so all of that notwithstanding, I think it still feels like this has been a meaningful journey in the last four years. And I'm fully. I do this work with full awareness of the fact that this institution might not be realized to full capacity in a sense, right? Like because you you build something to design capacity. This is often talked about in you know aircraft or you know uh, automobiles or whatever. Full capacity would be like you know whatever mark mark x or you know in a car like you know x kilometers per hour you never get to actually realize the full capacity you never get to use it at full capacity that's fine but the fact that you have you you, you're able to imagine and design a product or a i mean this is not a product i shouldn't even use that word an, an institution which has that capacity which at some point it will be pushed to realize anyway because there it is now on the horizon sitting there and um, waiting to be accessed, right? And waiting to be accessed by whoever is interested in it because learning and knowledge are public goods. They're common, you know, they, they belong to all of us. And so there's no reason for that opportunity to not be accessed by somebody else, right? And they might do other interesting things with it. And, you know, that... that... Uh, I wanted to, for a second, go back to um, the academic part of your life, uh, which unfortunately mm -hmm. still continues. But to ask you... Um, the history of science is a very peculiar topic and intersection. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, beyond just, I mean, finding it fascinating, uh, what intrigued you about it? And why did you go for that specific uh, intersection of things? Hmm. So, you know, when I started out, as I said, I mean, you know, I took the opportunity not really knowing what it was going to entail. Um, and when I started out, what I found really fascinating was my cohort, for example, right? Like we were six of us who joined that year and I was uh, studying with engineers, uh, economists, biologists, lawyers, and myself, who was a social scientist, like uh, civics and politics, right? Like, so the six of us from across um, various disciplines. And each of us approached our topic of learning in a different way. We would often read together. We would often share, you know, our, uh, our observations with each other. And so it, that collective learning was a huge part of why I began to love what I was doing, because it, it opened my mind to not only a new kind of knowing. So this was, you know, history of science in many ways is knowledge about knowledge making. Right, like because science itself is knowledge, and then history is knowledge about that knowledge, and so it's a it's a peculiar it's a peculiar discipline in that sense. Um, so, but to be able to do that with people who came from disciplines that I had no you know act, uh, no interface with prior to that, right? Uh, I mean, of course, at IIT Bombay, I did meet young engineers, and you know, uh, so that was probably one could say my first uh, interface beyond my little silo, um, you know, in an intensive manner. But this learning, where we were in the same classroom, we were trying to understand similar things, that I think made it very, very attractive because often you found that people mine very different insights from the same material. And to, to and it's surprising, it's actually very fascinating when you, you know, you, you, you read something, you think you understand it, and then someone else comes in and observes something completely different. That, that missed you because you didn't have the prior knowledge that required to be able to mine that information from the material given to you. So I think that um, knowledge about knowledge and then being a part of that small group, in that small group, the process of doing that itself, I think that got me deeper and deeper into it. And plus, of course, uh, I met my supervisor who uh, is a fabulous, fabulous teacher and uh, um, John Krieger and, you know, working with him um, also uh, gave me, I think, an appreciation for what the purpose of good historical work or what the purpose of good scholarship 
and research in any field might be right and and how you can how intellectual work is hard work that that's his phrase right like intellectual work is hard work and how you do it and and you know um what kind of satisfaction in many ways you can draw from it so i think it's a combination of you know my cohort and the madness of learning together and uh having a good mentor in that situation um you, you know meant um so yeah that's that's kind of the the process um i can of course speak more about you know the, the fascinating nature of of history of science itself but i i mean uh, that we can talk about for like hours i'm i'm sure we can do that uh but okay now so i want to ask you a question that actually uh, i mean so if you were to look at all the women in science and i mean through history I, you could answer about someone who's not in the sciences um but i think because you know uh, most about it <laughs> i want to know about that uh but is there someone who you particularly look up to and uh why mm or you think is particularly cool yeah so yeah that that again is a is a i mean in some ways it's an easy question to answer in some ways it's difficult so there are, there are there are a few people that i that i really admire for different things right like so there isn't one particular person but i admire different things and different people but i can i think if i were to kind of say no no you can't like go on and on so you have to kind of choose then i would there are there are two um female persons who i deeply admire or women who i deeply admire and uh, one of them is no longer alive one of them is still alive and the um the one who's no longer alive is ursula le guin who's a writer uh science fiction writer among other things and incredible i mean an incredible mind uh writing across genres bold and you know um with incredible confidence in what she was doing it didn't necessarily fit with what she, you know what was what was sort of the genres or the or the ruling sort of idiom around her in her day but she just did what she wanted to do right like which i find really tremendous and and uh, and of course her writing is incredibly engaging and she's an icon right like i mean by by keeping at what what it is that you know uh, she wanted to do and, and, a, and an incredible mind and similarly the other person who i, who I actually quite like um, and an and admire who's alive is patty smith who is a creative person across genres i mean she's a singer she's a poet she as she's an activist uh, she's a photographer um and um, you know has a very strong moral compass uh, about where you know the way the world should be what is good society what is good life and having said all of this she sounds like a mild, mild person but she's a punk queen i mean she <laughs> she's the mother of punk rock so pretty edgy right i mean it, it, and and that that that's the thing right like like or like when um patty smith is also you know for her time but also for our time you know incredibly edgy women with their mind and with their talent to make us think make us think about um you know what else is possible right like you know be it a different world altogether or be it sort of a reimagining of, of our society or simply just incredibly talented women whose work you can read or listen to or you know and and feel like oh my god like what talent right you know and what inspiration so so yeah so so those are those are my um those are the two women i actually do admire quite a lot yeah i think uh, yeah even i have those are some of the qualities i also really admire in women who are just sort of unapologetically themselves yes. and um, exactly know, taking putting their voice out and taking up space without feeling like oh you know trying to get smaller um but so we're unfortunately out of time now but uh, janvi it's been a pleasure talking to you and thank you so much for your time and for sharing all that you've done with us um it's been a pleasure thank you very much for inviting me and it's been a pleasure talking to you and you know it's i think this is the first time in my life i've, I've sort of been able to identify you know women who i admire etc so you know you, you made me crystallize thoughts that i hadn't so thank you very much for the opportunity <laughs> i'm glad thank you so much thank you thank you and to our audiences thank you so much for tuning in we hope that you enjoyed this episode and in case you liked our content please subscribe to our youtube channel and follow us on all other social media as well